Okay, thanks for coming tonight. We have a fantastic lecture tonight by Emily Pilliton, and I'm sure you all have seen her a bit. She's been, she's made some fantastic rounds. We sent around in letting everyone know about the talk that she's been a TED Talk person. She was on the Colbert Report, and she's gonna talk about some similar things tonight. Um, I wanna give you a little bit of background to her that you might not have heard. Um, she, she started off actually in architecture school at UC Berkeley, and she went on to study product design at the School of the Art Institute in Chicago. So we're hopeful that all of y'all are product designers and architects, and this is a topic that bridges those areas. And hopefully you can ask some questions about that um, as we, as Emily has done presenting, there'll be time for questions too. Um, after graduating from grad school in Chicago, she worked in furniture design and in interior architecture uh, for about three years before starting up Project H. And Project H, she's the founder and executive director. Uh, Project H stands for four H's, for humanity, habitats, health, and happiness. And through Project H has done a lot of different things. Um, in good designer fashion, she's thrown a lot of spaghetti on the wall to see what would stick. And one of the things that's sticking right now is some work that she's doing in North Carolina, in Bertie County. And her design work has shifted into education work, and she's now a high school educator. Toughest job there is. And with that, Emily Pilton. Hi. Um, is the volume OK? Can you hear me? Great. Um, thank you so much for the introduction and for having me here. Um, I, yeah, I mean, we have thrown a lot of spaghetti on the wall, and it, what I'm going to talk about tonight, though, is this one uh, particular story that has basically taken over my life. Um, for the past two years, we've been working in this location in North Carolina um, at the intersection of design and um, community development and um, education, and it's been quite an adventure. So this is, it's really good for me to, to leave Bertie County and be in a place like this in an environment like this and look back in on it um, and to get feedback about, you know, how crazy we really are. Um, but so I'll, I guess I'll start at the beginning for maybe some of you who don't know the, um, the origin of Project H or where we came from, but as, as Kirsten introduced, I studied architecture and product design and I did work in the industry for um, a little over three years and very quickly um, became really critical and disenchanted with a lot of what was going on in, um, in design, but specifically product design. A lot of it felt um, disconnected for me from, from problem solving, which is why I got into design in the first place. And so three and a half years into a, a short career of um, furniture design and some sort of retail related interior architecture, um, I just sort of threw in the towel and said, you know, I don't know, I don't know how to make design meaningful, my, meaningful for myself again, but I really want to try. So I set up this nonprofit called Project H Design with like no business plan and um, I was living with my parents outside of San Francisco and had a thousand dollars in my bank account and um, it was it was very much a leap of faith, but at the same time, it was um, a way for me to put a stake in the ground and say, you know, I believe that design is these things, and I want to figure out how to get back to those principles of design as problem solving. Um, so I, I have this like very vivid memory of standing in the Secretary of State's office in Sacramento, California, and holding the, my articles of incorporation, and the woman had just called my name, and I'm standing there like. You know, I felt like I was about to get married or something. That it was, it was the beginning of something that was going to define a lot of the rest of my life, I, it felt like. And um, it definitely has become that. So um, this was January 2008, so almost exactly three years ago when we got started. Um, and, and again, you know, with very little plan as to what the heck we were going to do or how we were going to do it, but with a, a really strong conviction um, about using design for, um, for social purposes. So the first... Uh, project that we took on, uh, many of you have probably seen this thing, it's called the Hippo Roller. It's a water transport barrel that's used, used and manufactured solely in South Africa. And I mean, it's a very iconic object, I think it's a really powerful thing. Um, we didn't design this, it's been around for 10 or 15 years, but we partnered with the company 
to help them lower their price point and to increase their shipping efficiency so that they could um, distribute this thing beyond the borders of, of just South Africa. Um, I'm showing this project though because it was a huge failure and it was like the first thing that we did that in a way, you know, I consider it to be a failure and I'll explain why in a second, but, but it was also an amazing thing for us to do right off the bat because we learned a lot of lessons that then would define, you know, the next two and a half years of our existence. Um, so what we did with this thing, you know, we, we were asked to redesign it. Uh, what we did was we cut it into two pieces and it became this like nesting two piece thing that shipped, you know, you could ship three times as many in the same space and we lowered the price point by about 40%, um, which was all great and seemed like a good solution, but we were sitting in San Francisco designing this thing for, um, you know, rural South Africa and in a place that we didn't understand or have any real personal investment in, um, but in, in our minds, in my mind, this was what humanitarian design was. Um, and ultimately, our redesigned version never got made. And, and there are a variety of reasons for that, and a lot of it is because of um, some internal struggles that the, the company has had in South Africa. But, but I also think it was because of our failures as a designer and not being connected to the place and understanding um, the economics in place, the end user, um, the context in which it needed to work. So I still consider it a failure, but a, a productive failure. So after this, this project ended and we saw just how much of a failure it was, uh, we sat down and said, okay, that didn't work out so well, but you know, what went wrong and you know, how can we start to put in place some principles that will help us not make those mistakes again? Um, so this is our form of a business plan. We still don't have a business plan and I'm proud of that because I think that instead of having a business plan, we have six core principles that help us make every single decision. Um, so these six things are, you, know, you can all read, but um, we design through action, we start locally, we design with, not for, that's a really key one. Uh, we design systems, not stuff, we document, share, and measure, and we build. So no matter what project we took on from this point forward, you know, whether it was an education project like the one we're doing now, or um, work with a foster care home, or whatever, um, we chose our projects based on these six things, and we executed these projects. Uh, based on these six things. So this was like you know, four months into Project H's existence. This is, this is what we had to go off of. Um, and over the course of the next two and a half years, we have sort of discovered as a happy accident that we are very interested in and I think sort of talented at the, um, the intersection of design and education. And, and I mean um, public K through 12 education. Um, and I'll tell the story of how we figured that out, but what we're really becoming interested in is, is design as, as a process and as a resource that is untapped within public education and then using design within education as a vehicle for broader community development and making public education more of a force within a community and not just like something that people go, oh, our public education system really sucks. Um, so fast forward to, to now. Um, my partner, Matthew Miller, and I, M Matt is a, also an architect, uh, but is sort of a like MacGyver type builder. He's a general contractor and he can like, build anything out of anything. Um, we teamed up soon after the Hippo Roller Project and have been running Project H together ever since. Um, but we moved our operations to Bertie County in North Carolina, which is the poorest county in the state. It's about two hours east of Raleigh. So if you're driving from Raleigh to the Outer Banks, we're like about halfway, halfway there and 20 miles north. Um, super swampy and flat and rural and um, poor. Uh, it has a lot of, a lot of big uh, social baggage. I mean, there's a lot of uh, racial tension and it's, it's the deep south in every sense of the term. Um, okay, so you're wondering why the hell did we move there? Um, the, about two years ago, this, this man, this is Dr. Chip Zollinger, um, fondly known as Dr. Z. Uh, he's the former superintendent of Bertie County and former superintendent, there's this whole like soap opera as to how he, how and why he was ousted, um, which I can maybe get into in the Q&A. But at the time, he was brought in by the state because the school district, which, um, this, uh, the whole county is 20,000 people. The school district is about 3,000 students. There's four elementary schools, a middle school, and a high school. Um, and at the time when they hired Dr. Zollinger, um, they were performing at a 26% passing rate of the state standard. 
and the state called up the Board of Education and said, you guys better get your act together or we're going to come in there and run it for you. And so their, their interim solution was to hire Dr. Z, who's known as, um, as a fixer. He was the superintendent in Denver and a lot of other um, big districts where he was brought in to, to fix a terrible situation and then he would move on. So um, he took over in 2007 and we hooked up with him um, after doing, one, doing a project that was published and he saw it and he wanted us to come down and I'll talk about that project in a minute. Um, a really visionary guy and he believed in the power of using um, design and, and like really innovative kind of outside the box thinking within a rigid structure of public education to make systemic change. So the project that he had seen was, uh, was this, it's called the Learning Landscape. Uh, we built the first learning landscape at a school in Uganda, which Matt and I, um, well actually, which Matt designed and built and I was there for part of the time. Um, and the first learning landscape we built was at that school. But so the learning landscape is this system, it's a framework for more active and engaged elementary level learning. Um, it's really, really simple. It's 25 tires buried halfway in the ground on a five by five grid. Um, we designed this so that it could be built, you know, out of the most rudimentary materials by unskilled labor in a day uh, for free if you, can, if you can find the tires. And the way it works is there's, uh, originally we wrote, uh, I think, 10 games. This is mostly for like K through five, but it can also work for some of the um, six through eighth grades. Um, but we wrote these 10 games as a way to get kids outside um, to learn through movement and competition and like running around screaming and being a kid. And so the game that they're playing here is called Match Me. So it, let's say I have a class of like 20 kids. You divide the kids into two teams and there's one on each side of the playground. And if I'm the teacher, I you know, take a piece of chalk and um, in this case we were doing um, addition and subtraction. And so you, know, you can write numbers, any numbers that apply to the skill level that you're teaching on the tires and then as a teacher, I might say, you know, three times six or 10 plus eight or whatever. And then the kids at the front of the team lines have to compete to figure out that's 18 and find the tire that says 18 and sit on it. So this continues until all of, all of the team members from one team are sitting on the tires and that team wins. So like really, really simple game. Uh, but we designed these games so that eventually they could be adapted for any other subject. Um, and so when we, we were called by Dr. Zollinger who said, you know, I saw this thing, the learning landscape, we have four elementary schools, would you come and build them? Uh, we said, yeah, absolutely. Um, but we also, we only had the 10 games at the time and we knew that we wanted to grow this into something um, that was open source that we could just say, you know, anyone wants to build one, go build it and here's all the games and construction documents. Um, so we worked really closely with the teachers on developing a lot, of, um, a lot of extra games. And so this is actually the assistant superintendent, uh, Mr. Perry, who, you know, we did this whole day of teacher training and asked them to help us design new games. And, and he won like 14 rounds of Match Me in a row and like would not shut up about it for like the next month and a half. He's like, oh, remember that day when I kicked your ass? Yeah, that's, uh, that was me. So he was like incredibly, you know, competitive, but also it proved to us that there was there was something about this kind of like kinesthetic learning, whether you were five years old or 55 years old. Um, and so this has become um, an ongoing initiative of ours that is now there are learning landscapes all over, not all over, there are 10 total and another 50 that will be built this year. Uh, but so this was our first entry into Bertie County. And after having done this project and working with some of the teachers and with Dr. Zollinger, this great visionary guy, um, we felt like there was a lot more work to be done. And, and he said to us, you know, while you're here, maybe you could take on like 15 other projects that I have in my back pocket. Um, and so we did. So we started working with him and um, starting to talk to some of the students about you know, what they wanted out of their school environments and their school experiences. Um, the next project we did was a, a redesign of three of their computer labs at the, uh, at the high school. So right now, I mean, these kids are tested to death. Like their, their experience is very, it's drill and kill. Like you take you take a test and then you go study more and then you come take another test. I mean, they're tested like way more than I ever remember being tested as a kid. And what that means is you know, their spaces, their classrooms are very, um, I think, inhumane. They're, they're not at all engaging. They're, they're optimized for those testing experiences. So the current, the current setup for most of the computer labs is that all the computers are against a wall and the kids come in and they sit and they face a concrete block wall and they take their test and they leave. And so Dr. Zollinger said, you know, that's, that's great and that's really functional, but we, but we want these kids to be 
more engaged around technology-based learning, how can we do that through design and architecture? And that was the extent of our design brief. He's like, all right, go. Um, so we, we had two, uh, two computer labs that we did in this scheme. Um, the idea here was to, instead of having all the kids against the walls, which makes a lot of sense practically because that's where all the power and the ethernet is coming down, and we pulled all of that off of the wall, so now all the power and ethernet is running down through these um, tree trunk things. And there's eight stations around each tree trunk. Um, but it allows, you know, it allows for a more collaborative space. You can do team-based learning. It's still instructional. There's a smart board that the teacher can use. Um, everything is connected. But, it, you know, on a very sort of superficial level, it's much more aesthetically engaging for a student. But it also becomes a more flexible and um, convivial space for um, technology-based learning. And then we did a, a second scheme on these labs that was more optimized for instruction, um, not so much of a, a pod-based scheme, but it was oriented towards the front. There was a very distinct front of the room. Um, and this was more for the, the STEM school that needed to do uh, more uh, uh, computer-based learning and, and, and instruction. Um, and then we did a really quick little graphic scheme for a project that we named called Connect Bertie. So Dr. Zollinger had also found $750,000 in grant money to provide a desktop computer and a broadband internet connection in every home that had a student in the public school district, which is a huge deal for somewhere like Bertie County where right now only like 14% of all the houses have an in-home internet connection. Um, and up until like a month ago, I didn't have, I, was, I could not get internet in our house because like the cables didn't go out there. Um, you either had satellite or what I did, which was squat outside of the Bojangles chicken joint, which had free Wi-Fi. Um, so, I mean, this was a huge deal. You know, not just because everyone wanted internet, but because it was coming from the school district. And the school district was the one making this like huge community change. So we did this um, really quick little graphic design, uh, like blue dot that, so this corner is the, this is like the Times Square corner of uh, Windsor, which is the county seat. So this is like the epicenter of Bertie County. Um, painted this giant blue dot and printed like 20,000 stickers and just started handing them out. And, you know, I've only taken one graphic design class, but my, I remember my professor was, um, he told us that a, bef a, a befuddled audience is a captive audience. So we just kind of handed out these stickers and didn't really provide any explanation. And, you know, before we knew it, the whole county was abuzz with like, what the heck are these blue dots and what's Connect for T? And then they made this big announcement. It was a huge deal and everyone was really excited about it. Um, so, and, and in a place like Bertie County, you can, you can do that where you know, it's such a small place and everyone knows one another and you do one small thing and the impact and the ripple effect is like exponential. Um, and that was really alluring to us as designers. So, so, you know, we've been there about six months at this point, and we've done a couple of projects and a couple others I didn't show. Um, but we got to a point where we were sort of like, you know, how long can we just be designers as consultants? I mean, we were, we were there acting as designers, you know, delivering something to a beneficiary, and we just kind of felt like there had to be a more um, engaged, a deeper way of connecting design and education. And so uh, we became high school teachers. Um, we decided, you know, yes, we could be designers for this school district forever. We could redesign every classroom in the entire district, but does that really lead to systemic change for these kids? And our answer was, well, no, it doesn't. Um, and we saw a, a huge opportunity to use our expertise as designers and builders um, as a platform for, for education within the classroom. And instead of us just flying in and dropping solutions to grow creative capital from inside this the school district and within the community. So we wrote a, a curriculum called Studio H, um, the premise of which was what, threefold. The, the motto is design, build, transform, which you saw on the, the billboard in the first slide. Um, and that's, that's kind of the crux of the whole thing. I mean, we're teaching design as critical thinking. We're wrapping that in a sort of standard shop class, uh, you know, industry relevant building skills um, environment and putting those two things to work on projects that can benefit the community. So, you know, I, I took shop class in high school and I made a, a cutting board for my mom, which like she loves, but you know, can't we do better than that? Or I think I also made her a birdhouse, like that's great. But, but I was handed plans for that birdhouse and I executed it and then I, I gave it to her. And so Matt and I both saw an opportunity to 
bring back shop class, but in a more kind of creative and critical way and to wrap all of that around what the community needed. So anything we were producing was for, was for a community benefit. Um, this is a really complicated diagram, but the crux of it is, um, you know, in thinking about all these things, we started to map out, like we interviewed a lot of teachers and a lot of parents and, you know, what, what do you feel like your students are lacking? What do your children need to succeed? And the four key things that we heard over and over again, maybe not in, in this terminology, but citizenship, creativity, uh, capital and critical thinking, you know, these are the four things that the students need to nurture in order to succeed as, as young adults. And at the same time, we discovered these are the four things that the community needed to survive, really. I mean, this place is like on the brink of collapse in so many ways, and, and these are sort of the four assets that they seemed to be lacking. Um, so, so yeah, we, we, you know, we became teachers, and we both of us have taught at a, at a college level, um, but we were, really got in over our heads with the whole 16-year-old uh, high school drama. Um, but you know, the, the, the curriculum is fairly, um, fairly straightforward. I mean, we wrote this so that there are two semesters and a summer term. Uh, we have the same students for that entire, it's a 12-month period, two semesters and a summer. Um, over the summer, as long as they meet a certain grade, if they have a C or better, they're guaranteed a job um, as an employee of Project H to build a big community project that they've spent uh, the spring semester designing. So I don't know, do you guys know the Rural Studio program out of Auburn? It's a design build program. So we took a lot of inspiration from, from that type of program, but we also felt like you know, Rural Studio is great for a lot of reasons, but you're still importing college level design talent to a place you know hours away that really needs it where you know why can't we build that from within and do that within um, the public high school so that was kind of the um, the general idea the nuts and bolts are you know, these are junior level students uh, we started with 13 we're down to 10 because two failed the first semester and the other had an incident with a power drill which I can also maybe tell in the Q&A um, they are, so all these students are part of a specific track within the high school called the Early College Agri-Science Track. So they've signed up for this specific track so that they're eligible to earn college credit while they're earning high school credit. So they're, in our program, they're earning 17 college credits over the course of this one year. Um, and the class that we have now is actually the entire junior class in this track. They were the first class in this track. Um, the, the track is only three years old. So um, this year it's required for all of the juniors, um, three hours a day, every single day uh, for the entire school year. Um, okay, so I have a little video clip that this is like a glimpse into the a day in the life of Studio H. I hope the volume works. Okay. Oh, where do I start? Can you hear that? was a concept that we came up with about a year ago. So much of what you see in public education instruction is one directional. It's the teacher giving information to the students. It's not so top down. It's not teacher here, students up here. We started to think that we could actually teach design as a way to get these kids excited, to be more creative, critical thinkers, and to orient that design process around community development. And then back here is a room for them. Get their food and water out, and back here they can have like little chew toys and things like that. I'm Cameron Perry. I'll be 16 in two weeks. My name is Karan Hayes. Colin White. Teresa Deshaun Thompson. My name is Eric Bowen, and I'm a junior at Bertie Early College. The kids actually come out with 17 college credits uh, over the course of one year. And just kind of set that right on top. I want the kids to have a bit of a feedback loop so that as we're getting into this, they have a say. We don't act like normal teachers. You know, you'll work with Matt, learn how to use a table saw, a bunch of stuff in the wood shop, do some graphic stuff. It's not like a regular class where you just write down on a piece of paper, you actually get to do stuff. We're just happy we get to do it.
right. Um, okay, so now I'm going to walk you through our year to date. Um, so I should also say that you know these students are juniors, but they're also there's a lot of remediation that we've had to do that we did not anticipate. Uh, we're really starting with scratch or starting from scratch with a lot of these kids. Um, haven't had an art class in sixth grade. Most of them haven't had a PE class in seventh grade. Most of them are reading at like a sixth or seventh grade level. Same with math. Uh, we had to teach them how to read a ruler. Um, we did not anticipate that. And so it, we realized very quickly how much catch up we were going to have to play. And so we, we planned out the year around three projects. And the projects started at a really small scale and will end with this farmer's market pavilion that I'll talk about um, in a bit. But you know, we started with this like boot camp idea that you know how can we very quickly get them from you know, zero to sixty on a few key skills. Um, we knew you know we weren't going to get the critical thinking and, and the like really um, honed in design thinking skills right off the bat, but we knew we could build the basic like this is how you use a table saw without cutting your finger off, and this is how you you know measure eight and three quarters inches. And we wanted to build sort of a baseline um, that we could work off of. So. Everything from like what a plan section elevation is, it turns out green peppers are a great object for like figuring that out. Um, the sections are really beautiful to draw. Um, and then, you know, basic color theory, like what's a primary color and what's a secondary color and why is that important to know? Um, shop safety, uh, again, measurement and layout. Um, the, the amount of, of tutorials lecture, or lesson plans that we had to do on reading rulers was amazing to me. I really, like I was shocked that we would say eight and three quarters and no one could find it on a ruler. It was like one of those things that they just, I don't think they'd ever been asked to do that. They all knew what three quarters was, but to find it on a ruler was a huge leap. So, um, you know, in a way we were also having to be their math teacher and their English teacher and their social studies teachers all along the way and um, trying to integrate some of that core learning. So, okay, the first project, this boot camp project, does anyone play the game Cornhole? Okay, so if you don't know Cornhole, it's, uh, it's this like really lame, frankly, um, carnival style like beanbag toss game. And there's two boards that I think our regulation is like 27 feet apart uh, with a hole in the board and you toss a beanbag and try to get it in the hole. Um, really lame, but like insanely addictive and um, really popular in Bertie County. So we we're thinking about, you know, what's something that's simple and colloquial and fun, like that can just, it's like a warm up exercise. So it turns out the cornhole board is like a perfect thing to build um, that teaches you all the basics in the wood shop and also is a, is a graphic design exercise. Um, so, you know, we went through the whole production process. We gave them each two sticks of lumber and, and a chunk of a four by eight sheet of plywood and you know, walked them through all the tools. What is this? It's a drill press. How do you use it safely? Uh, there was a huge hurdle with, with some of the female students. I mean, the fact that, A, I'm, I'm female and know how to use all these tools was like shocking to all the boys. Um, but then I'm going to teach Alexia and Jamisha how to do it too. Like, what's really going on here? There was a, a big stigma around girls being in the, in the wood shop in the first place. Um, but then most importantly, one of the biggest lessons they learned here was the importance of precision. I mean, if they were off by an eighth of an inch, like you knew it and you knew it pretty quickly and you could see it because your cornhole board didn't sit right. Um, so, you know, measure twice, cut once. So it was like the biggest lesson that they learned. Um, a lot of them had to redo stuff, but, you know, we wanted them precisely executed. Um, and then, and then the, the whole idea of, like, graphic design was very foreign to these students. I mean, we just did a little test and said, okay, well, what do you guys want to put on the cornhole boards? And most of them did, you know, I want to put NASCAR or, you know, like, the NC State logo and a wolf like up in the corner and or like seven up and I mean it was just it was very uh, it was interesting that the, their version of graphic design was really you know logos from big companies um, so we did a little intro to, to graphic design and, and as a way of you know finding a place to start is like a huge that's the biggest hurdle for a lot of these kids so um, Richard Serra the sculptor right so like 30 or 40 years ago he wrote this list of action verbs things like um, to rotate, to hinge, to laminate, to twist, to fold, to bend. Um, so we gave each student, uh, you know, two colors of bean bags and one of those words. So this was, I think this word was hinge. And we said, you know, draw that. What does that mean to you? And you know, the, the sketches were really rough, but eventually we started refining them. And this, you know, he had drawn these little white dots and was like hinging these, um, these fields of color off of them. 
like pretty abstract thinking for a kid from Bertie County, but it got us somewhere and it and it got them to a place um, so far beyond like the NASCAR logo, something that was really beautiful and designed and had um, conceptual clarity to it. So we took those sketches, um, taught them the basics of the Adobe Creative Suite, um, drafted all of their graphic concepts in Illustrator, and then again back to precision. Like now we have to execute it. So you know, tile it, print it use this like very intricate method of, of taping and painting. Um, and, and then this was, I'll show you some of the final. This was um, weave on the left and stretch on the right were the words for, for this pair. And then twist on the left and fold on the right. And then some of the final boards. So, you know, a lot of this was just kind of breaking down what their expectations of what they could do were and showing them that they could go beyond what they're used to seeing. Um, so we, we auctioned these boards off. It was their idea to auction them off, and then the minute we had to give them away, they were like heartbroken that they were <laughs> giving away their, their babies. And, um, but we, you know, we held a public auction and we invited a bunch of people out. It was, it was more than anything a, a chance for the community to see what we were doing. Um, but we used those funds from that auction to fund our second project, which we just finished which is um, public chicken coops. So we're working up in scale, right? So a cornhole board is like this scale, a chicken coop is like this scale, and a farmer's market is like, you know, building scale. So um, the, the chicken coops, though, we arrived at this idea because the biggest employer in Bertie County is Purdue Chicken. And um, I don't know if you guys have seen Food Inc., but you know, needless to say, they're not, they're not the best company. Um, but a lot of our students, families, are, are employees or contractors under Purdue. Um, one of our students, Stevie, has 10 chicken houses on his family's land, and each one of those chicken houses has 25,000 chickens in it at any given time. So 250,000 chickens going through his family's farm on a six-week cycle from, like, bitty chick to, like, bowling ball-sized Purdue chicken ready to be killed. Um, so this is what they know of chickens. This is, like... How they think, you know, poultry, Purdue, and, and it's my family's prosperity, and I have to go and at 5 a.m. take the, like, chicken vacuum cleaner and suck up the dead ones. Like, this is, you know, that, that's their relationship to, to chickens. And so, you know, our job as, as instructors was to make sure what we were, what we were doing was con contextually appropriate. I mean, this is something that they are aware of, and it's part of, of the community, but to kind of flip it on its head and ask them, well, what does it mean if you have you know, not 250,000 chickens, but like four chickens in your backyard in a well-designed coop who can produce eggs for your family, um, just to, to look at it through a different lens. Um, so this was also their first opportunity, really, to design for a client, the client being you know, both the chickens and then the person using the chicken coop. Um, so Matt and I one day were wandering behind the, the shop in the woods and found this old um, truck hood fender thing, like from a semi truck. And so we pulled this thing out of the woods and we're like, you know, we, if we're going to design chicken coops, we need to get to know our clients. So let's turn this, th we, like in a day, we you know, made this makeshift coop and um, got two chickens from my friend's farm and put them in this coop and said, okay, students, like, go get to know your client. And so for three days, we just sat there observing them and um, learned a lot that I didn't even know about chickens. Like, well, you know, how do they like to eat their food? Apparently, they don't like eating out of a trough. They would rather, you know, peck for it in straw. And they like their roosting box to be a certain height off of the ground, but not too high, but not too low. Um, so we learned all these really interesting, interesting things through observation of the chickens. Um, and at the same time, you know, gave them some constraints like, okay, what you design has to protect them from the weather, from predators, um, you know, they have to have light and heat and certain things um, that all fell into the design brief. And so this was also their first, first attempt at, at form making. I mean, the, the graphic design from the cornhole boards was, you know, sort of form making, but this was their first like architectural attempt at, you know, where do ideas come from and how do you make them stand up and how do you make them beautiful? Um, and also their first attempt at an iterative process. So on the first day I gave someone a white erase, uh, a dry erase marker and said, um, okay, draw me a chicken coop. And, you know, they draw a box with a roof like this. And, um, I was like, all right, that, that's a good start. Now draw me a hundred more. And they go, what? That's a perfectly fine chicken coop. I'm like, I'm sure it is, but you haven't designed it. So give me a hundred more and then we can talk. Um, so, and you know, that was just like, they're like, are you kidding me? Like, what's wrong with this one? So that was a big hurdle as well. 
Um, so I'm going to show you the first two chicken coops, and then the third one I'll talk a little bit more about um, the process that they went through. Um, but so the way this worked, we had 13 students. They all started individually with one concept. We went back to those Richard Serra verbs, but instead of just giving them the word, we turned them into full sentences that had some kind of architectural clause on the end. So like, um, to hinge the sky to the ground. I just made that up. I don't remember what it really was. Um, or like, you know, to stretch the life cycle of everyday materials. We took those verbs and then tried to make them architectural in a way. Um, so we started with 13 concepts and then we narrowed it down to six. We teamed them up um, based on which of their concepts were compatible. And then of those six, we chose three to actually build on a $500 budget that they had to plan out, like down to the, to the nail. Um, so this was the first one. Uh, the kid with the 250,000 chickens, Stevie, this was, this was his concept. Um, he was really interested in the geometry of like a kind of tweaked pentagon. Um, and he also was really clever and was like, okay, we have a $500 budget. If we use reclaimed materials, if we go and like, you know, pull some stuff out of my dad's garage, you know, maybe we'll be under budget and maybe they'll let us keep whatever we don't spend. And I was like, well, well, no, but I'm glad you're, you know, thinking resourcefully. Um, so he brought in like 50 pallets and they spent days pulling, um, pulling the pallets apart and like pulling the nails out, which I don't know if any of you have tried to do, but it's messy, messy work. Um, and then eventually, so they laid out these frames, um, built a really sort of rudimentary um, tube steel frame for it, uh, this like corrugated ribbon roof. And then this was um, the final version with these swinging doors. They, they named this the chicken cabinet. Um, and so actually the, the little gray box inside, this, the other kids, the Stevie's on the right, the CJ on the left with the hat, um, when they were fishing for pallets, they, he also found a file cabinet. And he's like, well, why don't we just use that? You can like stick the chickens in the drawer and shut the drawer and they'll lay their <laughs> eggs and you pull the drawer out and there's your eggs. And I was like, hey, man, if that's what you want to do, just you know, make it work and make it comfortable for the chickens and go ask them what they think. And, um, so th this is not a file cabinet, but it's definitely inspired by the file cabinet. The dimensions is, is two drawers, sort of on, not drawers, but shelves on top of each other. Um, and then, so now this is home to uh, Henrietta and Jezebel who lay their eggs in the, in the chicken cabinet. Um, okay, the second one, this was um, Colin and Anthony were the team leaders on this one, and they took a, a much more functional approach. They were looking at um, you know, our, our design brief, like what were, what were the requirements, and their approach was, okay, well, we have to provide, above all else, we have to provide roosting space and then food and water space. So they had this idea of like taking two cubes, one for roosting and one for food and water, and trying to like put them together in an interesting way. So they did all these sketch models. Um, specifically with this project, we said, you know, you don't need to do that much drawing. Let's just model the heck out of these ideas. So they, this is like five out of probably 30 models that they built, trying to figure out um, how those squares could somehow collide together. Um, and what they, what they came up with was this really interesting, like two cubes connected by this like really interesting twisted run. Um, they had the same idea about if they could be under budget and keep the rest of the money. Um, so, but but the, the slats that you see along this twisted run, they found this pile of old um, tobacco sticks, which are like the sticks that, you, that they use in barns to, to hang dry the, the strands of tobacco. Um, and they're like four feet long and a pretty hard wood and they found like hundreds of them so they wanted to use those as the slats. So as they're working on this model and trying to figure out how to get it to stand up, they wanted one here and, and one up here, they couldn't, they couldn't get it to stand up right and it fell over and when it fell, it kind of fell on its corners and it was sitting you know, on each of the cube's corners. So the version you see there with the duct tape, that's, that's actually, you know, it fell down and they were like, that's way cooler than what we were trying to do, let's build that. Um, so that's actually the version that they, that they went with that we, that we actually built. Um, this was a pretty simple construction. It was, uh, you know, just a plywood, or sorry, a, a frame from two by fours and um, siding and some, a little bit of interior architecture on the inside for the roosting boxes. Um, and then this like steel frame for the, the run that also provided support for those things to sit at such a weird angle. Um, the tobacco sticks, which were stained um, the same color as the, the siding. And then this is an interior shot of the run uh, looking from one box to the other. Um, 
and then it, we went crazy with zip ties. Zip ties were our saving grace. And then this is the final version. Um, and the team, Anthony, Jamisha, Colin, and Rhodey. Uh, and then the third one, I'll walk you through a little bit more what the, um, what the process was, because I think this is the most interesting. Um, before they even started looking at, at concepts, we said, you know, before we start talking about architecture, let's, let's understand architecture. So we gave them each a, a precedent study, and I'm sure you architecture students know what that is very well. So, you know, you look at a piece of iconic or famous or inspiring architecture and you dissect it and analyze certain elements of it and you take away lessons that then can inform your own design process. So one of our students, Eric, had Buckminster Fuller and um, both the geodesic dome and the Damaxian house and was really, really, like, fell in love with the, the geodesic dome. It was just like he could not believe that, that this thing, you know, was so perfect but made from such small little modules. So like in such lovely geometry. So when, he, when we went to design the chicken coops, he started playing with um, you know, how you could take a flat piece of cardboard and give it shape based on geometric slicing in a way. He did probably 100 different models of this. Um, and originally it was like slices in just one direction. And then we said, OK, well, what if you do it in two directions? Like, Does that give you more form or less? Uh, what he ended up with was this really cool kind of folding ribbon that you know, he he finished it and he's like, here's my chicken coop. And we're like, I don't really know if that's a chicken coop, but but sure, like, let's go with it. And the, the side on the right where um, you can kind of see there's like a little, it folds in, um, that ended up being the, the roosting box. And and the other two have very distinct sort of habitats for the roosting and the, and the food. But in this case, we said, you know what, fine, it, it can just be a giant run and we'll have a little spot where they can keep each other warm. Uh, we had a public critique, and they got a lot of really great feedback on how to get this thing to stand up, um, whether it was okay or not, that it was just all one big run, and I think a, a lot of our critics actually really liked that. Um, so this was the final model, and this one in particular, like the other two, we had dimensioned construction documents, and when we went to build, like we knew you know, our material list and the dimensions and angles of things. This one, this is all we had. We are like, I guess you know we got to figure out how to how to do this at a larger scale and like really had no idea what I still have no idea what those angles are, um, but it was a an interesting challenge for the students because they were not it wasn't like they designed it and then they build it they built it they were designing all through the design or the building process and having to go back and forth between the studio and the shop and constantly having to readjust things um, especially you know the biggest challenge here was okay so in this model you know there's it's not just bending in one direction. There are like multiple angles of folding, and it was a much more complex form than we than we imagined. Um, so we did like six or eight prototypes of what that hinge might be, and ultimately the the one that worked was this like Oreo cookie sandwich between um, two pieces of plywood and then a strip of sheet metal, and then you could fold it along that piece of sheet metal. Uh, and this was all them. I mean, we we really like. You know, we made them work through it and figure out what would work. And so this was um, a piece of the roof, and eventually this whole thing came together as a giant rectangle, um, the same way that he was working with the cardboard. I mean, that his roof started as a piece of rectangular cardboard. So you know, here we have this thing, and we're like, all right, we got to get it to look like that model. Um, so we had to raise the roof day, and we had all 13 students um, literally like lift this thing up. <laughs> as like this wet noodle, this floppy you know, noodle. And as we're lifting it up, I'm like, Matt, grab a two by four, like jig this thing to the wall. It was all guess and check. And, and they were, Eric, who's in the middle there, was um, leading the, the troop and you know, trying to get people to bend and push and pull. And um, eventually this thing started to, to start to look like um, its real form. But this, this took about two hours you know, to get it to look right. Um, you know, sticking posts to hold things at the right um, heights, um, but eventually it, it came together, and so the model's sitting on top, and it's it's basically the same thing. Um, and then you know, building the the steel steel frame to actually get it to stand up by itself, um, figuring out those com compound uh, cuts on the on the steel, and then they covered it in a a rubberized paint, and so this was the final version. Uh, and then the sides are just chicken wire. Um, and then this is the team, Eric, Alexia, 
Quran and Cameron. So this one, I really enjoyed this one because they, at the beginning, they did not think this thing would stand up. And the whole way, I could see them doubting themselves. And then by the end of the day, like, oh, well, you know, actually that part does stand up. Um, so this was really like an amazing example of um, the power of designing and building in tandem. Um, and for them to, to go from, you know, the chicken coop with the roof like this to something as crazy as this, um, we had an open house for the, the families and other teachers to come out, and all of them were like, what the hell is that thing? That's a chicken coop? And I mean, they, they were so proud of the fact that they could you know, push beyond what they knew to be a chicken coop. Um, so this one will end up at the town park. Um, the crazy one with the two cubes will end up at the high school for an ag, agri-science teacher who does a, a poultry lesson every year. And then the one, the chicken cabinet one, is going to a, a family that lost a lot, of, um, a lot of their backyard and a lot of their house in a recent flood. Um, this, so this is downtown Windsor. This is in October. Um, the whole town was basically underwater. And so this, this actually was the inspiration for our final project, which we just started on Monday, um, this past Monday, like four days ago. Um, so the flood happened, and you know, everyone's trying to rebuild their own homes and the downtown, and it was, an, it was a great moment for everyone to stop and think about, you know, we do have a chance to rebuild, and what do we need as a community? And one of the things that our students heard um, and identified themselves was that there's no farmer's market. This is a, it's an agricultural county, and there's no farmer's market. So in the same way that the chicken coops was like, there's this big, large-scale force in Bertie County, what does it mean to make it small and personal and scale? The farmer's market was sort of the same thing. Um, so on Monday, we went to the state farmer's market in Raleigh and started our research phase. So we had all of our students go and interview every single vendor. What are you selling? Why are you selling it? Um, why do you come here? It, you know, how much money are you making, if they were willing to answer that question? Um, what do you like about these facilities? What would you change? Um, and so, yeah, this just started on Monday, and, and we're, the goal here is to have you know, working construction documents uh, for a design to be built over the summer by them. Um, the design phase will go about until May 1st, and then we start building on June 1st. Um, which is terrifying to think about having a construction crew of 16 year olds. <laughs> but, uh, um, so, okay, just to, to wrap up here, I mean, I, I think, you know, looking back at the Hippo Roller, which is where we started, I think for me, I mean, obviously I, my life has been turned upside down moving from San Francisco to a place like Bertie County, but, but I think the work, you know, the differences are pretty clear. Um, we're trying to move design away from being product driven to being process driven. and you know, we feel like if you do, if you can do design with the right type of process, the product will, will reflect that. Um, but instead of focusing just on the product, let's, let's focus on the process and embed that process within places that it, that it didn't exist before. Um, like a, a community like Bertie County and within the public school district in, in Bertie County. Um, so, and then the last thing I would say is, you know, my business card right now says high school shop teacher even though my training is as a designer. And I've, I've found that I, I really think that design has the most power when it collides with things beyond the design bubble. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, I spend my days like welding with 16 year olds, but, but having that background and putting it in a place where it has the capacity to build creative capital where it didn't exist before, I think is, is really exciting for me. Um, and I think, I hope that it becomes more of, um, the norm for us as, as designers and as creative thinkers. Thank you. Um, so I think we have time for at least a couple questions. Um, go ahead. Mm. Oh, it was really tragic, actually. So. Uh, on the last day of fall semester, like right before Christmas break, he was one of the, one of the smartest kids really, but had a lot of uh, behavioral issues. And this is the same kid that called me a, a useless B word on multiple occasions, like real issues with authority. And um, anyway, so on the last day of, of fall semester, he, we were finishing up the chicken coop builds and um, he took a power drill and stuck it in another kid's back and pulled the trigger and went through this kid's jacket, sweatshirt, t-shirt, and like just 
barely hit his skin. And we hear this like yelp in the corner and we turn and we're only two people, with two sets of eyes and we turn and there's like this cloud of cotton fibers and this kid's sweatshirt is like spun out into this hole. Um, so, you know, that was that, he was done. And it was, once he realized that like that small moment had such consequences, he was like, well, does that mean I can't, you know, I don't have a job next summer? And we're like, yeah, that is what, you, that, that's exactly what that means. And it was really heartbreaking for us to have to, to do that. But he, you know, he even said to us, like, I was just joking, it was just a joke. Well, you signed a contract to be safe in our shop and you broke it. So the, this is the consequence. So that was really heartbreaking for me because he, he was one that I felt like we really could have, um, we could have swayed to the, to the successful side of, of our class. And there's, there are a couple of students who we know will succeed no matter what. And there are a couple of students who we know, I hate to say it, but are probably lost causes. But it's like that middle 60% chunk that I think we can really affect. And he was, he was in that chunk and quickly moving in the right direction. And yeah, so that is the story of the power drill. I don't know, actually. Um, it's funny, though, because that the space that, that used to be a testing room with the towers that we turned into that, um, they don't use as a testing facility as much anymore. I mean, they still do, um, but it kind of had this like reverse effect that we made it really cool, and so now they want to use it for instruction and less for testing. Um, I mean, they still do, but not quite as much. There's like a sign-up sheet if you want to use it. It's like a very highly you know, coveted room for teachers to be able to use. Um, I don't know. I, I, would, I should probably look into that. <laughs> Um, I mean, they're teenagers. They're a nightmare. But um, yeah, it's very day to day. I mean, I will say, though, that um, they were not used to having to do things in a, as a team. I mean, we asked them, like, how often do you do team based work in your other classes? And they said, almost never. And they preferred that because they would rather, like, you know, do their own thing. And if they don't do their homework, they don't do their homework, whatever. Um, so for a lot of them, it was uncomfortable to even have to work with anyone else. Um, but you know, from the beginning, we said, you know, you guys are in this together. And yes, there are components that are individual, but you better get used to like, you guys are going to get to know each other a lot better than you did ever before. Um, there's definitely personality conflicts, like, it, you know, those logic puzzles where you're like, you have to get this family across the river, but the mom can't be in the boat with the son. And if the son and the dad are together, the dog has to be there too. It's like. <laughs> Exactly like that. Um, and we really, like, when we put together the chicken coop groups, it was, it took us, like, hours and hours on end to figure out, you know, well, Jamisha cannot be with Tysias, and, like, who can we put Tysias with? And if he's there, well, then we should also have Cameron. And um, it's, uh, we spend, like, at least a third to half of our energy just, just trying to, like, mitigate the social issues so that we can even start to think about teaching. Um, I mean, I think there has been some improvement, like very incremental, um, but they work better as teams now than they did at the very beginning, certainly. Um, but there's still a lot of petty, like on a day-to-day -day basis, just like the constant soap opera. You mean functionally? Um, well, it was a couple things. Mostly it was things beyond our control. So the, the company was based in Johannesburg. Um, they branched off a U.S.-based nonprofit to manage some of the donations coming from the U.S. And then the woman running the U.S. side of things got in this huge fight with the guy running the South Africa side of things. And um, basically everything fell apart and with it went our redesign. So that was beyond our control. But I, I still think that you know, functionally, functionally it may have worked, but in hindsight, I just feel like it was a very disconnected process and very, 
in a, in a lot of ways dishonest um, for us as designers to be sitting in San Francisco like, so what do you think these ladies in South Africa might do if dot, dot, dot? It was just, and that's part of the reason when we wrote those tenants, you know, one of the first ones that we wrote was we will only work locally um, in places where we're invested. So, you know, I, I honestly, I don't know if, if they had made it. I'm, I'm pretty, pretty confident that functionally it would have, you know, stayed together and it would have been functional on, on a day-to-day -day basis, but I, I still don't think it, as a process, it was, it was not um, an ideal, and certainly not, we weren't invested in it personally. Uh, go ahead. I'm curious about the, the building you're going to build. Where are the funds coming from? That what is your budget? We have um, two grants from, one from the Adobe Foundation and one from the Kellogg Foundation. So we are funding every everything, um, the brick and mortar, the salaries for students, um, were entirely self-sustaining. The well, the town of Windsor, though, I mean, we we went to the mayor is our neighbor, and he's like the, an awesome guy. He's always been really supportive, and we said, you know, Mayor Hoggard, can you please give us a piece of land to build on? And he's like, sure. How about these three? Take your pick. Um, and. <laughs> You know, this is part of the reason we're doing this in a place like Bertie County, because you can do that. I mean, we can never do that in, like, Brooklyn. Um, so, yeah, and they've, they've been really wonderful in helping us work through, um, you know, who's going to manage it once it's built. The Chamber of Commerce has come in and partnered with us. Um, so they've certainly give us, given us a lot of in-kind support, but all of the, the financial backing is, is our funds that we've raised. Um, yeah, um, I get asked this question all the time, and I think, well, mostly we get asked, like, how are you going to scale this? And I, I hate the S word. I'm like, I don't want to talk about scale. I want to talk about, you know, my students. But I know that there are, there are reasons to, uh, there's validity to, you know, wanting to take pieces of what we do and, and apply it to other places. Uh, personally, I... It is very challenging for me as as a designer, as a creative person that thrives off of like community and um, and a female, I mean, a, and a half Asian girl from California. It's a difficult place for me to live personally, um, but I, I think we will stay there as long as as long as we have the ability to do so, you know, financially and and with the right support from the right people. Um, in terms of the scaling issue, I, you know, so much of what we developed for this curriculum was tailored specifically to this place, um, to what we could build, what needed to be built, the needs of our students. A lot of it is very site specific, um, but I do think there are pieces that could go elsewhere. However, you know, part of my beef with public education is that I think what got us into a lot of the messes that we're in is, is too much of the, the large scale, like off the shelf curricula that you know you drag it and you drop it and you pray that it works and then it doesn't. Um, and I feel like instead of us saying we're going to scale this nationally, um, our version of scalability has been transparency. That if we can make everything that we do available to anyone, if if someone called me up tomorrow and said, I want to I want to do a Studio H in you know rural Nebraska, I would say awesome you know here's all of the materials we use to develop it um, but I think the work needs to be put in on a local level to ensure that it's relevant and um, and tailored to those kids in that place because I don't know anything about rural Nebraska and and I, that to me that's what makes it successful is that it is so site specific to these kids in this place so I would want to know that if it did go anywhere it had the structures in place to make sure that that work was done um, at the outset to make it really, really relevant. Yeah. How much cooperation and support do you get from the other teachers? And do you work together on, like, for example, the math teacher uh, on a common curriculum or the integration of what they do in their program? Um, oh, man. The, you have to remember that the school district is the worst in the state. 
And um, there's a couple things going on. One, the other teachers see us as, well, okay, I'll give you an example. Last semester, we had the students in the morning um, until lunchtime, and then after lunch, they went back to their core subject classes, and we got a call from the history teacher who taught the class right after lunch, and she said, what the heck are you doing with these kids? They're so riled up, they wanna, they wanna be active, they won't sit down, like, why are you teaching them like this? You're just getting them riled up. And we were like, because it's what they wanna do and it's how they learn. You know, maybe you could teach a little more actively, don't put your baggage on us. You know, so there's a lot of like, you know, they, but I mean, these teachers are te they're teaching from the book. They're teaching to the test from the book. And I think they're interested in what we do, but if it means them having to do extra work for it to complement what we're doing, they, they won't do it. And so you know, we've tried really hard, we've invited them out. Um, they've come to the studio, they've seen the chicken coops, but I don't think that they've made the leap between, here's some interesting things that they're doing that might also work in their math class. Um, it's definitely gone the other way where like we've had to find, like with the ruler, I mean we had to teach, we had to do a whole day of basically a math lesson. Like I know nothing about teaching math, but I know that they need to learn how to read a ruler. So there was a lot of us having to build in core subjects that I hope, I hope, um, helped them in some of their, their other classes. But there hasn't been as much cooperation as I would like. Um, and that's partially just because I, I don't think that the other teachers care to put in the time. It's, it's really sad. It's very heartbreaking for me to see these kids going um, into classes with teachers that are so apathetic. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, the story, um, God, this also breaks my heart. Um, he, okay, without getting into like the really nitty gritty details, I mean, basically what happened is, you know, the state hired him. He's this very well educated white man. Um, the school board is all African American. Um, they're publicly elected officials. They've basically never, they've all run unopposed. Um, the only requirements are you have to be 18 and not have a criminal record. Um, none of them have kids in the school district. They're in it for the power. It's a $30 million budget um, in a county. The, the school district has $30 million, a $30 million budget. The county has a $3 million budget. So these are the most powerful positions in the county run by completely unqualified individuals. Um, I hope they're not listening right now. Um, it's okay, they already hate us. Um, so, you know, to the point where, like, the, we're in a board meeting reviewing accounting documents and one of them says, what do the red numbers mean? Like, that actually happened. You know, like, this is who we're dealing with. So, um, what happened, I mean, a lot of it was, was, I th it was racial, really. Like, who's this white guy coming in and trying to tell us how to run our district? Uh, well, he's incredibly qualified. That's who he is. Um, but, you know, they, they see it as an outward, or uh, someone from the outside trying to tell them how to do what they think they know how to do. Um, it was partially that. It was also, um, I think they just, yeah, it, it was a power thing more than anything. They felt like he, the, the superintendent before him and the superintendent now are really just um, puppets for their, you know, go do this, go do this, and the superintendent goes and does it. Um, and he didn't believe in that. He was like, look, I'm here for a reason and I'm gonna lead and I'm gonna make changes. And that was, it was a lot of change really fast, which is what needed to happen, but it scared the hell out of them. Um, so long story short, they were like just waiting for an opportunity to get rid of him. They found it in this accounting glitch that he had nothing to do with, uh, but they blamed on him and they called it fiscal irresponsibility um, for this missing $65,000, uh, which they then coincidentally found as soon as they fired him. Um, but along with him went, you know, anyone he ever hired, they fired. Um, any program he brought in, um, you know, there's this great school that was um, bringing kids from the juvenile system back into the public school system, hugely successful, shut it down. Um, Teach for America, he brought in Teach for America. They're in the process of weeding it out or just like shutting it down slowly. Um, so we were on the chopping block as well. and had all this grant money, had all the, you know, we had the curriculum written, we were ready to go. This is four weeks before school started. And uh, we had to go in front of the board and like 
basically beg them to, to keep us um, after they had shut down everything else. And the only way they would let us stay is if we said, fine, you don't even have to pay us. Like, you never have to give us a dime. Just let us run this damn program. Like, please. And, um, and so they're like, fine, fine. We don't ever want to talk to you again or give you, we will not give you a dime, but fine. Go. If nothing else, you're two free teachers. Go. Um, and that, you know, that's, that's been the relationship um, ever since. And so as far as they're concerned, it's a courtesy that we're even around. Um, the irony, though, is that everyone else, the parents, the teachers, the students, um, the community, the mayor, the town council, the chamber of commerce, love us. And they're like more than willing to help us and to make what we want to do possible. Um, it's these five people that, that make our lives really miserable and they hold all the cards. So it's, it's kind of, it's tragic. Um, and it's not just us that think they're crazy. I mean, this is like a huge uh, point of contention for the entire county. Like a lot of people want to overthrow this, this school board um, because they're not serving the kids at all. Um, go way back in the middle. Yeah, um, the students for the most part, I, on a very basic level, they see it as like, oh, thank God, I don't have to sit in a chair and listen to that woman yap at me for an hour and a half. So if nothing else, they see it as like a more fun way to learn. Um, but I think some of them, not all of them, but some of them have made the connection between um, between the importance of you know hands-on learning but also looking at things that are going on in your backyard more critically. Um, because a lot of them are, they want to have community service hours, they want to be doing things you know, that make a difference, um, but they haven't really had that opportunity, especially not within the classroom. Um, so that's been a big advantage for them. I think they see it as a way for them to give back, which is, which is great. Um, yeah, I mean, one of the, they just, a couple of them just took their SATs and one of the kids, Colin, um, came back and I was like, oh, how was your SAT on Saturday? And he's like, it's really good and it was fine. And, you know, can I tell you about what I wrote my essay about? And I was like, yeah, sure. And the, so the question was something about, um, you know, what is idealism? And do you think it is an important trait uh, to have as a, as a young adult? And so he wrote his essay about, and I was like crying as he's telling me this. Um, he wrote his essay about how he always thought idealism was just sort of like, you know, for overly optimistic, naive people and never got anyone anywhere until he was in our class and until he made the connection between idealism and setting goals for yourself and getting from here to there and having instructors that were very clearly idealists and believed in doing things in a different and hopefully better way. Um, so yeah, and I think a lot of that is just is because of as I was saying earlier, because of the other teachers that they have and those teachers don't really um, exude hope and you know I'm not like the cheeriest person but I definitely believe in these kids and so I think if nothing else they see that and they see the class as a place to explore and to be creative and to and you know to be idealistic and that that's a that's okay there's one back there somewhere oh let's go here so what's your future what's 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 the longer term goal for, for project based actually as well um you know, I, I, as I said, I would love, to, I would like to be there as long as we can. And if that's a year, or if that's another week, and then the school board kicks us out, or if that's forever, um, but we've kind of, we've, we thrive off of not making long-range plans because, you know, we go back to those six tenets, and if we are faced with like a, a tough decision, I mean, that's that's what we go to. In fact, recently there was a school um, in the Bay Area that that wanted us to come and bring Studio H to them. And we're still like really struggling with making this decision, but, but my gut, and you know, going back to those six tenants, my gut says we really have to, we have to see this through in, in Bertie County. And it, both Matt and I have made the mistake before of doing a project, you know, finishing it, cutting the ribbon and leaving, and hoping to God that it works, and, and they don't. And so I feel really strongly that we that we see it through. That you know, I would love for in five years our our current students to, c to come back from college or wherever and and you know tell us if, if it had any impact on them and to see you know where they've gone with it. 
Um, I don't care if they go into design. I, I'm not trying to recruit designers, but I would like to know that it, it had some influence on you know, what they're studying or how they think. Um, so yeah, we'll, we will stay there as, as long as we can. And um, as far as Project H as a, as a greater organization, I mean, this is really becoming the heart and soul of what we do. And there are still like a couple little peripheral projects and the learning landscape is still going, but, um, but I feel like we're really, like we're finally on to something that, um, that may very well define the organization for, for the long haul, so. Maybe one more? Anyone? Or no more? Okay. All right, thank you.